Sometimes moving forward involves going back. What I mean by that is when we're looking to the future, it can be helpful to contemplate the past. I'm here today as the female owner of a sustainability company in the fourth largest metropolitan region of the United States. Three years ago, I started a subscription service for the environment. But I don't want to spend my time here today talking about balance sheets or business plans, nor do I want to get political about climate change and the environment. I'd like to start by telling you the story of one woman. Her name is Wanda. Wanda Lee Hill was born on February 13, 1925, in Flo, Texas, a small town about two hours south of here. She was one of nine siblings born and raised on a working farm. The family grew and sold cotton. They raised chickens, cows, and hogs. And they had a large vegetable garden and fruit trees that would provide produce for the family throughout the year. Trips to the store were only necessary for essential items like flour, salt, or coffee. And the cloth bags that housed those items were cut up and sewn into quilts that would keep the family warm during the winter. When the Great Depression began, Wanda was four years old. Living off the land meant that Wanda and her family experienced every link in the chain of events that brought food to the table, whether it was planting and nourishing seeds or hatching chicks, and then eventually harvesting all of those things and enjoying them for a fried chicken Sunday dinner after church. Mealtime was the culmination of days weeks, and sometimes months of hard work. So everything was savored and nothing was wasted. When the Great Depression ended, our country was on the verge of World War II and Wanda was 14 years old. And her story continues from there. So you're probably wondering at this point, who is this Wanda lady? Well, Wanda was my grandmother and she helped to raise me. I spent every summer and most holidays at her house, running around barefoot outside like a wildling. I loved to follow her around outside, listening to her fascinating explanations of what was happening in nature. She meticulously observed everything and seemed to know all of the answers to random questions that I would ask her about plants and wildlife. Wanda sewed my dresses for church made curtains for my bedroom, and she made beautiful quilts for our family to enjoy. She grew most of her produce in her backyard garden, and she walked to the store once a week for some household basics. Any leftovers were not thrown into the trash, but they were stored religiously in her freezer, or they were taken outside to her compost pile. To save water, Wanda would wash her dishes in the sink in two compartments. One was for washing and one was for rinsing. And that water was not poured back down the drain, but it was carried back outside to the garden to water her plants. Her household waste was consolidated into one grocer, grocery sack, and it was kept under her kitchen sink and disposed of once a week in the curbside container. It was never full. My childhood spent with Wanda was magical. I never questioned her. She was very shy and gentle, but she was also incredibly tough and resilient. In my 20s, I moved to New York City. And for eight years, I enjoyed a really fulfilling personal and professional life. I worked at big organizations, and I even earned an Ivy League master's degree. On most holidays, I would fly home to Texas, and I would always go back to visit Wanda in her little yellow house in her little town. And I found myself trying to upgrade her way of living. I would buy her Tupperware, expensive cleaning products, for goodness sakes, a plastic trash bin to keep her trash under the kitchen sink. But she would inevitably make me return those items, and she would chide me for wasting my money. It was the first time in my life that I can remember being frustrated with her at what I thought was her being overly stubborn and even a little primitive. 
On the drive down from Dallas, it was about two hours and I'd always be tempted to get some fast food meal, especially at Texas Burger or some local Texas um, joint. But I would refrain because I knew that she had slow cooked a meal from, for me, harvested from her garden, and it would be ready for me to eat promptly at 5.30 p.m. On one particular visit, I can remember suggesting to her that she and I should try to knock out a quilt together over the weekend. Well, there was a long pause, and she looked me straight in the eyes and seriously said, honey, quilting is slow work. Inevitably, I gave up trying to change my gr grandmother, Wanda, and I decided that I just wanted to be more like her. I left Manhattan when I was 30, and I became a wife and mother, and Wanda and I became even closer. She mentored me on gardening, cooking, composting, even raising backyard chickens. We would swap stories, mail each other seeds, rejoice when one of us had our first big tomato of the summer, and collectively mourn when a squirrel or a blue jay got to our ripe peaches. Wanda passed away in late 2019 at the wonderful old age of 95. She lived independently up until her last year in her little yellow house in the town where she was born and raised, and she maintained her fall and spring gardens until the end. Wanda lived a sustainable, zero-waste lifestyle before those were even terms or trends. I miss her every day. The path of this talk has been incredibly nostalgic so far, so I'd like to fast forward to our present day reality. In most urban centers, one can have virtually anything delivered to your doorstep within a day, and in some places within two hours. Forgot your toothpaste? One click will handle that. Need some ketchup for the barbecue? You can have it between 4 and 6 p.m. It is impossible for us to move forward as a, as a society with these trends of consumer convenience and rampant waste without there being long-term consequences. It is my humble opinion that those consequences will be environmental, economic, and societal in nature. This is a photo from a 2019 article in the New York Times citing the fact that every day in New York City, approximately 1.5 million packages are delivered to households. Households now receive more packages than ship, need, receive more shipments than businesses. Considering the fact that the population of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex is parallel to that of New York City, we face a similar reality. It is impossible for urban society to move forward with these patterns of consumer convenience and waste without there being serious long-term consequences. And I believe those effects will be environmental, economic, and societal in nature. Let's just take a look through the lens of our consumer relationship to food. And first, the environment. The UN says that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of methane gas into our atmosphere behind China and the US. Here's an economic figure. Every year, American consumers, businesses, and farms spend an estimated $218 billion producing, transporting, and disposing of food that is never eaten. Here's a societal angle. The largest source of food waste in America is consumers in their own homes. That's right, more than businesses, restaurants, grocery stores, or any other part of the supply chain. Food is the single largest item in our everyday trash, and yet one in seven Americans is food insecure. I started a sustainability company serving my community because I realized that for most people, living life like my grandmother Wanda is unrealistic and very undesirable. Solar panels, composting, growing your own food at home, reducing reliance on plastics. 
there is a massive and ever-growing list of ways that we can change our behaviors for the better, and it can be overwhelming. One might argue that my grandmother Wanda lived the way she did because she didn't have a choice about when or where she was born or the circumstances into which she was born. Perhaps that's true. After all, we now have the luxury of so many choices, so much knowledge and progress, so now we know better, don't we? Or do we? It is my humble opinion that the pendulum of consumer convenience and waste has swung so far, too far, from the era of our greatest generation and the way of life that my grandmother Wanda lived. I began the time talking about the past and one person, and I'd like to conclude my time talking about the future and me and you, us. What small everyday steps can we take to live more sustainable lives, to be just a little bit more like Wanda? It may be completely unrealistic for you to grow your own fresh tomatoes every summer, but I guarantee you it is pretty difficult to kill some rosemary. Does the idea of composting and bugs disgust you? I do not blame you. Start by recycling one thing at home, in your kitchen or your yard, like coffee grinds, eggshells, or fallen leaves. You know those big, nice glass jars that you get your spaghetti sauce in? Don't toss them. Rinse them out and use them for food storage instead of buying more plastic. Do we really need that ketchup delivered to our doorstep between 4 and 6 p.m.? Let's pause and think before we click. Friends, we've lost the greatest generation, and yet we have the chance to be and create the next greatest generation. Let's do better. Let's turn a corner on our way of thinking about convenience and waste. Let's turn the, the tide of our decisions to focus less on what is best for us in the short term and more on what is best in the long term for our future and the planet. Thank you very much.